Welcome. My name is Divine. I am a fourth year medical student. In today's episode of the Divine Intervention Podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, neurology. And this is primarily for people that are taking a third year neurology shelf or those that um, are studying neurology for step one or step two CK. We'll do this in parts because if I were to do one full review, it will take many, many hours. So let's begin. So the first question talks about a brain tumor that can present with a loss of uh, vertical gaze. Okay, so obviously um, the thing I'm going after here is a pineloma. Okay, remember uh, this can present as Parinode syndrome. Basically, remember that the pineal gland is located, if you look at the brain stem, it's located superior to the superior colliculus, and the superior colliculus is the vertical conjugate gate, uh, gate center. So whenever you have a pineloma, a mass that's compressing the superior colliculus, you will get into problems with vertical conjugate gaze. Okay, next question. 13-month-old child with a history of hypopigmented macules presents with seizures. So what's the diagnosis? Uh, What are the EEG findings and how is this treated? Okay, so this kid, uh, let's assume this kid has ash leaf spots. Okay, they are the hypopigmented macules you find on the skin in tuberous sclerosis. So the seizure syndrome that has a very strong association with tuberous sclerosis is something known as West syndrome. Uh, Every now and then you see people refer to it as an infantile spasm. Okay, the classic EEG finding you want to be aware of, you don't need to know how to spot it. We need to recognize the buzzword is a hypsarrhythmia. Okay, and it's treated with ACTH. It's an unusual answer. That's why they love it on exams. Or you could also use an uh, anti-epileptic drug known as Vigabatrin. Okay, it's a GABAergic uh, agent. Okay, next question. So this is a fairly long one. Uh, The most common primary brain tumor in kids... Uh, We'll talk about a medulloblastoma, pendymoma, craniopharyngioma, GBM, acoustic neuromas, um, and some other stuff. So I guess let's just talk about it right now then. So basically, the most common primary brain tumor in kids is a pilocytic astrocytoma. Okay, so because it's an astrocytoma, right, you and uh, astrocytes are kind of glial cell. The marker is GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, okay? And the classic finding on histology are things known as Rosenthal fibers. I'll encourage you to look up a picture of this. Uh, they're like pinkish, like eosinophilic fibers. They're sort of shaped like corkscrews. And then a medulloblastoma, the common location on exams is the cerebellum, okay? And the associated histologic finding is a homerite rosette. In fact, I would encourage you to do a Google search for the four main types of rosettes in pathology. It lays out like the different kinds of rosettes, like ependymal rosettes, homorite rosettes, perivascular pseudo rosettes, and stuff like that, and tells you the tumors that they are associated with. Although I'll also mention that here. Okay, so homorite rosettes are classically associated with medulloblastomas and usually grow in the cerebellar vermis on exams. Now, an ependymoma on exams usually presents as hydrocephalus. Okay, because it may grow in the ventricular system or like the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, and on histology, you may find um, perivascular pseudo rosettes or ependymal rosettes. Okay, again, do that Google search I just mentioned. For craniopharyngiomas, they love to see if you can uh, tie this in with embryology. They are classically derived from a structure known as Radke's pouch. Okay, and on imaging, if they tell you that a kid presenting with like seizures or visual problems, uh, they do like some kind of brain imaging, you see calcifications, you can pretty much stop reading the question and know that they're getting you to think of a craniopharyngioma. Okay, Uh, it may present with bitemporal hemianopsia, right, because it can compress the optic chiasm. And it may also present with signs of hypopituitarism, right? So like deficiencies of the anterior pituitary hormone because it can compress the pituitary gland or the pituitary stalk. Now, uh, GBM, right? So glioblastoma multiforme. uh, It's the most common primary brain tumor in adults. Uh, Although remember that METs to the brain are the most common cause of uh, brain uh, cancers in uh, in adults. Uh, Usually like they're usually like Uh, multiple masses or they're usually like very well circumscribed or you find them at like the blood brain barrier or at the gray white junction okay those are classic for mets but the most common brain tumor that arises from the brain itself is glioblastoma uh, multiforme 
okay? And the classic presentation on imaging, they may even describe this in a question. They may say it's a butterfly-shaped mass that crosses the corpus callosum and it has this, has like a ton of edema and central necrosis. That's the big buzzword you're looking for, central necrosis on imaging. You really want to think about GBM with that, okay? And again, because it's an astrocytoma, in fact, uh, neurosurgeons call this a stage 4 astrocytoma, right? The tumor marker is a GFAP. Now, for bilateral acoustic neuromas, uh, it's basically a kind of schwannoma, uh, classically involves cranial nerve 8. Um, the big tumor marker you want to be aware of, they love this a lot on exams, is S100, okay? And the thing is, if you see bilateral acoustic neuromas on an exam, the first big thing you really want to think of is uh, neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay, and these tumors they are almost almost always at the cerebellar pointing angle. Okay, in fact, if you get an exam question that says the most common tumor found at the CP angle, okay, is a is an acoustic neuroma. Okay, the second most common it will be a meningioma. Okay, now, uh, so that sort of leads to our next question, right? So parasagittal mass along the fox cerebri, you really want to think about a meningioma. Okay, so they usually show up at uh, convexities in the cerebral cortex, like the fog cerebri, for example. Okay, um, the classic histological finding is a samoma body. Okay, remember, samoma bodies are common in meningiomas and they are common in papillary thyroid cancer and they're also common in uh, serous uh, cyst adenocarcinomas of the ovary. Okay, so those are your high yield samoma body associations you sort of want to take away. So um, and if they don't put samoma body on your exam, they may try to trip you up with the buzzword laminated calcification, okay? That's a classic MBME strategy. You take what you know and just put it in a different language, okay? So just be mindful of that. Now, the calcified mass in a kid that crosses the midline, uh, that'll be a neuroblastoma, okay? They try to trip you up on exams by getting you to differentiate this from Wilms tumor. Okay, so Wilms tumor is usually unilateral and does not cross the midline. A neuroblastoma usually does cross the midline and it almost always has calcifications on abdominal imaging. That's what will tilt you away from a Wilms tumor. Now, the neuroblastoma, it's a neurotumor, right? So you could also find it in the posterior mediastinum, okay? Remember that for these exams, they love you to know what kinds of tumors arise in the anterior mediastinum or the posterior mediastinum and stuff like that, okay? So neurotumors in general, like the neuroblastoma, can arise in the posterior mediastinum. Uh, the anterior mediastinum is more like uh, thymomas and teratomas, okay? Your terrible T's. Now, uh, neuroblastomas, they do have an association with neurofibromatosis type 1, okay? And they also have an association with a weird syndrome known as Beckwith-Witherman syndrome. Beckwith-Witherman syndrome. Now, Beckwith-Witherman syndrome, it's one of those things that you see people get wrong quite often on exams. And the big thing you just want to remember here are the associations, right? So, a neuroblastoma is one Beckwith-Witherman association. Another high-yield association is overgrowth of one side of the body. Right, so it's like uh, they call the buzzword there is hemihypertrophy, where one side of the body is bigger than the other. Um, another association with uh, uh, beckwith witherman syndrome is uh, hypoglycemic seizure in a newborn. Okay, because BW syndrome is associated with hyperplasia of the beta cells of the pancreatic islet, so they produce a ton of insulin, which can severely lower their blood uh, the neonates blood glucose levels and uh, precipitate seizures. So that's another association you want to know. And also, Wilms tumor is also associated with beckwith witherman syndrome. One more tumor is uh, a hepatoblastoma, right? So if they present a question where um, you see a right upper quadrant mass in a neonate and they have some of these other BW syndrome findings, think of a hepatoblastoma, okay? It's a mass in the liver. Now, a tumor with a fried egg appearance, uh, that's more oligodendroglioma. Uh, on exams, it will almost certainly be in the frontal lobe. Uh, hemangioblastoma is a brain tumor that produces EPO, okay? So if they give you a person that has like signs of increased ICP headaches, like chronic headaches, and uh, they tell you that the patient has a, a hematocrit of like, I don't know, like 60%, something like super high, uh, think of polycythemia from uh, uh, hemangioblastoma. 
And the thing is, these tumors, they have an association with the von hippo lindau syndrome, VHL, okay? And usually they try to treat them because they can actually cause a life-threatening hemorrhage uh, in the central nervous system because they are hypervascular. Okay, so now we're done with this one. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, so recent viral illness plus vertigo plus tinnitus. Uh, hopefully this gets you thinking of labyrinthitis. Uh, another way they could frame this on an exam is as a vestibular neuritis, okay? So if you basically see a person that has like vertiginous symptoms, they have to like ringing in the ears and they recently had a viral infection or some kind of upper respiratory infection, the first thing you want to think about on an exam is labyrinthitis, okay? And then if they tell you the person has the feeling like the room is spinning and this feeling comes when they change positions, uh... You really want to think about BPPV. Uh, BPPV stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Okay, so it's a positional vertigo, right? So as they change position, they have a triggering of that feeling like the room is uh, spinning around them. And another classic thing they put on exams is that uh, the person, when you're doing a provocative maneuver to make the diagnosis, like the dix hall pike maneuver, they have an astagmus uh, as uh, that uh, test is being conducted okay and if you want to treat this uh, you basically try to do maneuvers that displays the otholits in the semicircular canals that are triggering the symptoms uh, some of these maneuvers there's like the epley maneuver there's their summon maneuver uh, there's another one that's like probably offers like zero yield for exams I believe it's called the Brandt Daroff maneuver, okay? But those are different ways you can try to displace the otoconia, if you may, into the right spot so that the symptoms are relieved. Okay, next question. Anesthesia over the medial thigh and weakness in thigh adduction. So anesthesia over the medial thigh and weakness in thigh adduction, this is a obturator nerve injury, okay? Uh, those are classically arise from L2 to 4. Okay, it's just one of those weird neurological uh, complaints that are tied to like a specific nerve that they love you to know for for shelf exams. And then anesthesia over the lateral thigh uh, is classic for injury to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, right? So that kind of makes sense, right? Lateral femoral because the femoral, the femur is around the thigh area, right? So that's an easy way to remember that. Now, next question: seven-year-old kid with ataxia, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and lower extremity hyporeflexia, okay? So what's the diagnosis? What's the genetic pathophysiology? Uh, how is this inherited? Uh, I would actually say some special things there. And then what's the most common cause of death in these kids and how can this be treated? So this child has a Friedrich's ataxia, okay? The classic presentation is a kid with ataxia, okay? With cardiac problems, usually uh, from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and also low extremity weakness because they have destruction of the posterior columns of their spinal cord, sort of like what you find in a vitamin B12 deficiency. So this kid has Friedrich's ataxia. <clears throat> the mechanism of inheritance is autosomal recessive, okay? The thing is they love to test the mechanism of inheritance because this is one of those trinucleotide repeat disorders that does not have autosomal dominant inheritance, okay? Uh, most, I will say in general, most trinucleotide repeat disorders have autosomal dominant inheritance, but there are certain exceptions, like Friedrich's ataxia. Friedrich's ataxia has autosomal recessive inheritance, okay? So they love to test that because it's unusual. The associated mutation is a GAA trinucleotide repeat, that basically causes a loss of function mutation in the frataxin gene on chromosome 9. And when you have this loss of function mutation, you have reduced levels of frataxin. The thing is, frataxin, I think of it as an iron binding protein. So think of it, if you don't have, if you have a deficiency of a protein that binds iron, iron can run amok and cause a lot of problems. It can cause like problems in the cerebellum, that's how you get the ataxia. It can cause some problems in the heart from oxidative damage. That's how you get the hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, potentially, okay? So, um, associate Friedrich's ataxia with GAA trinucleotide repeats, autosomal recessive inheritance, ataxia, low extremity weakness, okay? And uh, cardiac problems like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in a kid, 
okay uh, the most common cause of death in this kids actually is uh, uh, is a congestive heart failure from the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and certain arrhythmias that you commonly get and I mean you can try treating the heart failure with a beta blocker but most of these kids uh, ultimately are succumb to the illness unfortunately okay so let's jump to the next question so 35 year old female with a BMI of 35 with visual difficulty and severe intermittent headaches okay she takes tetracycline for acne ding 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 so fundoscopic exam is consistent with papilledema what's the diagnosis uh, what kind of diagnostic testing would you want to do? Uh, how is this managed pharmacologically? Uh, what other things could you do? Lifestyle changes, surgery, blah, blah, blah. So let's talk about this, right? So uh, young female with visual difficulty and a very high BMI. Hopefully that gets you thinking of pseudotumor cerebri. Another name for this condition is uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, Okay. Now, if these patients present, usually the first step in management is to get a fundoscopic exam, okay? Uh, classically, you'll find a papilledema. So you're like, hmm, papilledema. So this person potentially has increased ICP. So the next thing you jump to is to then get a head CT, okay? The head CT will be stone cold normal. And then you'll say, okay, I think this person has pseudotumor cerebri. So your next step after that will then be to get a lumbar puncture, okay? And on a lumbar puncture, you classically see elevated opening pressures, okay? So it may be like more than 200 or 250, even up to 500 in some cases, okay? I believe the unit I'm using here will be uh, centimeters of water. So uh, they have very high pressures on lumbar puncture. And um, the way you actually treat uh, IIH, so idiopathic intracranial hypertension, is to recommend weight loss, okay? Uh, you can also try to decrease the production of CSF with azidozolamide. Okay, remember azidozolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Alternatively, you could also do serial lumbar punctures. Remember, lumbar punctures are uh, diagnostic and therapeutic of this uh, disorder. Uh, you can place a VP shunt, okay, to try to reduce uh, uh, sort of shunt uh, CSF to like the, uh, the GI tract, for example. Uh, you can also tell the patients to try to avoid triggers like vitamin A derivatives, right? So like treatments for acne, like isotretinoin or uh, antibiotics, actually, right? So your 30S inhibitors that are bacteriostatic, like tetracycline. Uh, if they have like very bad visual difficulty, that's like uh, sort of like getting them close to like being blind. You can also do a surgical procedure known as an optic nerve fenestration. You basically just poke holes along the path of the optic nerve to relieve those pressures. Okay, next question. Management of an ischemic stroke, uh, your initial imaging, time window for TP administration, uh, some contraindications to the administration of TPA, uh, blood pressure management strategies in stroke settings, okay, including the drugs that you could use to make that happen. And then uh, we'll talk about the concept of permissive hypertension in patients that uh, that have ischemic strokes that are not going to get TPA. So, for example, let's say they presented outside the time window. So let's answer these questions, okay? So, uh, in an ischemic stroke, in general, your first imaging test is a non-contrast head CT, okay? Because that helps you differentiate between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke, okay? You don't give contrast because contrast looks just like blood on CT imaging. So that would make uh, the diagnosis of uh, hemorrhagic stroke very difficult, okay? So you perform a non-con head CT first, okay? And then if it's negative, you then get an MRI because an MRI is very sensitive for the detection of an ischemic stroke, okay? In general, if the patient presents within three to four and a half hours of symptom onset, it is safe and they don't have contraindications to the administration of TPA, you can go ahead and give those people TPA, okay? Um, this is super low yield, but it may be a thin that shows up on an exam, but you can actually go up to six hours if you can inject TPA directly into the involved vessel. Now, there are certain high yield contraindications to the administration of TPA, right? Because again, I mean, if you give TPA to some people, they can bleed out and die, which is not ideal. So, certain high yield contraindications are things like a bleeding disorder, right? Or a person that has like GI bleeding, or they had like recent brain surgery, or they're on anticoagulation and their PTINR is like super high, so they're like overcoagulated. In general, for those people, you want to go ahead and avoid a TPA. 
because the risks of like severe bleeding and death are probably not worth uh, probably not worth uh, the try. And in general, if a person has an ischemic stroke and they're not getting TPA, okay, uh, you can actually allow their blood pressures to run high so they can perfuse the brain. Because in an ischemic stroke, right, you have something known as a cytotoxic edema. Uh, that's a concept that's probably not very relevant to our discussion, so I'm going to skip that. Although if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me or look it up. But basically, uh, they have cytotoxic edema, so the brain is beginning to swell. So their intracranial pressures are in increasing and that's further decreasing brain perfusion. So you let the person's blood pressure run high. Uh, in fact, the cutoff classically used is you can let the pressure run as high as a 220 systolic over a 120 diastolic, okay, to keep the brain perfused. Although if a person is getting TPA, you don't want those kinds of high pressures, right? So they don't bleed out and die. In general, your blood pressures have to be below 185 over 110, okay, if you're gonna get TPA. And if a patient has a hemorrhagic stroke, right, so not an ischemic stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, and they have very high blood pressures, or they have uh, some kind of hypertensive encephalopathy, you can try to lower that blood pressure with drugs like labetalol, remember that's an alpha beta blocker, or nitroprusside, which is a powerful uh, dilator of blood vessels. Uh, you could alternatively use a nicardipine. Nicardipine is a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And then, um, I think that's all I want to see on this slide. Okay, good. So let's jump to the next one. So, 78-year-old is brought to the ED by his daughter. He reports a 15-minute episode an hour ago where he completely lost vision in one eye that has since resolved. So what is the next best step in management? Uh, what's the pharmacological management? Uh, what are the surgical strategies you could employ? And what is the most important modifiable risk factor for stroke? They love this stuff on the MBME risk factors risk factors so let's answer this question okay so this patient had a tia okay uh, transient ischemic attack okay um, if you want to be a little more specific he has something known as amaurosis fugax okay the classic description on exams is as a curtain coming down over the eye that causes like a painless loss of vision okay so in general for these patients you want to do a couple of things right so you want to get some kind of brain imaging like a non-con head ct first or an mr uh you could also get an mri if the non-con head ct is negative uh you could get an echocardiogram to deter the uh, cardiac cause of the vascular insult alternatively you could also get a carotid ultrasound with doppler in fact i will say on exams um the answer i would most likely go with <coughs> excuse me if I was asked about imaging in this patient population, is a carotid ultrasound with Doppler, okay? Because most TIAs arise from like em, uh, uh, like embolism or like hypoperfusion through the carotid arteries, okay? And classically, you hear a carotid are brewing with that, okay? Now, in general, this patient, uh, you probably want to place them on aspirin. I'll say aspirin is like a safe answer on exams. If they are intolerant to aspirin, like they have like aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, um, which was previously, I believe, called aspirin induced asthma, you could consider giving them a clopidogrel instead. Okay. Uh, also on exams, I'll say a mix of aspirin and extended release dipyridomol. Uh, the drug name is like Agranox. Uh, could also be used. I believe there's actually studies that have shown that a mixture of aspirin and dipyridomol works better than uh, aspirin alone. Uh, the only time I will say that giving heparin or some kind of anticoagulant like warfarin is a uh, right answer on exams is if they tell you that, oh, an echocardiogram reveals like some kind of valvular pathology that may predispose them to embolic phenomena, or they tell you that the person has an irregularly irregular rhythm on telemetry, right? So they have AFib, for example. That's probably the only time where giving an anticoagulant like heparin or warfarin is a reasonable answer choice on a test, okay? And in general, I mean, there are some very specific uh, criteria for these, but the big thing I'll just say is if stenosis detected on a, on ultrasound or like CT angiography of the carotid uh, artery is more than 70% in a guy, okay, so in males, and they're symptomatic, you generally want to refer them for something known as a carotid endarterectomy, okay, a carotid endarterectomy. And the most important modifiable risk factor for a stroke is a hypertension, okay? Most important modifiable risk factor for a stroke is hypertension. Okay, now, a six-year-old male with a difficulty walking plus using his arms to walk up his leg slash thighs 
plus hypertrophy of the calves bilaterally. So what's the diagnosis? Uh, how do you test for this? What's the genetic pathophysiology and how is this inherited? Okay, uh, what's the elevated serum marker? How do you treat this? Uh, what's the most common cause of death? We'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about a close causing disease. Okay, so this kid has something known as Gower sign. Okay, so that should tell you that they have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay, in general, the way you manage this is you want to check uh, creatine kinase first. It will usually be elevated. Okay, because those people's muscles are classically being uh, uh, broken down. Okay, and then the next thing you want to do is to do a dis check for dystrophin gene mutation. Okay, um, don't be deceived by an answer choice that says to do a muscle biopsy on exams. Uh, that is no longer the standard of care. Okay, in general, you want to check a CK first as your first step. Okay, and then the next thing you do is to uh, do DNA testing <coughs> for the dystrophin gene mutation. Okay. Uh, dystrophin is actually a gene, uh, you find it on the X chromosome, and it connects the cytoskeleton of uh, myofibers, right, so like skeleton, like muscle cells, um, to the extracellular matrix, like the basal lamina, okay? So if you have a complete, like, loss of function of that gene, right, complete loss of dystrophin, you get into, like, a lot of muscular problems, okay? Um, in fact, in the Q-stem, I described that, oh, the person's calves are big. Uh, it's just a deposition of fat and fibrosis in the lower extremity that causes that calf pseudohypertrophy that is classically associated with, associated with uh, Duchenne's uh, muscular dystrophy. And in general, this disease, uh, it's inherited in an X-linked recessive fashion. So it's probably not a girl disease on exams, okay? And you treat with uh, steroids. Steroids improve survival somewhat, although that's to a very limited extent. Uh, you also try to like give these kids like very solid, like high calorie nutrition. And most of them, unfortunately, die from uh, like respiratory failure or like cardiac failure when the muscular dystrophy begins to involve their their own organs i mean their their cardiac and uh like uh, like the muscles that control respiration like the phrenic i mean like the diaphragm for example uh the close causing disease here is a uh, becker muscular dystrophy uh they tend to live to their 50s uh they tend to not have intellectual disability and the part it's also a dystrophin gene mutation also x-linked recessive inheritance but usually these kids uh don't have a complete loss of dystrophin okay they have like a pretty severe loss but they still have like some dystrophin activity good so let's jump to the next question confusion plus ophthalmoplegia i'll say this ophthalmoplegia on exams it classically presents as an astagmus okay plus ataxia right so like walking uh like you just uh uh took too much booze, okay? And a chronic alcoholic, right? So uh, this should hopefully get you thinking of Wernicke's uh, syndrome, okay? It's a triad on exams, right? They won't say, oh, a patient walks in with confusion, ophthalmoplegia, and ataxia. No, they're not gonna do that. They're gonna describe a person like staggering in the exam room, and they say, oh, you perform a fundoscopic exam or some kind of eye exam, and you detect nystagmus, and then they, they will probably pose the question to the person like, oh, where are you? And they can say they're, I don't know, like in Mars or something ridiculous, okay? You sort of need to put all that together to know that it's Wernicke's encephalopathy, okay? And if you add on to other symptoms where they're like making stuff up, that's known as a uh, confabulation, or they are um, having amnesia, they're beginning to forget stuff, okay? They have progressed to Korsakoff's uh, psychosis. In general, Wernicke's syndrome is reversible, but Korsakoff's is not. And the classic imaging finding in these uh, disorders, right, because it's a spectrum, like Wernicke's all the way up to Korsakoff's, you, if you do like brain imaging, you usually, usually an MRI, you'll find the hemorrhagic infarcts of the mammillary bodies, okay? And the deficient vitamin here is vitamin B1, okay, thiamine. And no, I don't think this has exactly been proven, but there are many schools of thought out there that believe that some of the findings you get in this disease are from problems with uh, proper function of transketolase. Remember, transketolase is one of the big enzymes. It's probably the rate limiting enzyme of the non-oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway, also known as the hexose monophosphate shunt. Okay, so they believe it's problems with transketolase because transketolase uses vitamin B1 or thiamine as a cofactor that causes many of the problems you observe in Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. And in general, your treatment here is uh, IV thiamine. Okay, good. Next question. Uh, classic presentation of myasthenia gravis, right? So the way myasthenia gravis presents is usually a female in her 30s to 50s, okay? Uh, presents with a diplopia that's worse by the end of the day, like 
like uh like double vision or she says that oh she has like her eyes drop she finds it difficult to keep her eyelids up by the end of the day or difficulty swallowing that's another classic presentation or they have like some kind of weird speech okay if you see all those things young female um and it gets worse the more you test it think about myasthenia gravis okay if you want to compare and contrast this with lambert eating myasthenic syndrome <coughs> Um, Lambert intake myasthenic syndrome uh, usually shows up more in older individuals, right? So people in their 70s, uh, classically in patients that have a small cell lung cancer, okay? Uh, and the thing is, Lambert intake myasthenic syndrome actually gets better when you keep testing the muscle function because as you uh, as you may know the pathophysiology involves uh, the formation of autoantibodies against presynaptic voltage gated calcium channels okay so when you form those autoantibodies they attack that presynaptic voltage gated calcium channel you don't have the entry of calcium that causes the exocytosis and release of acetylcholine from vesicles at the neuromuscular junction so you can run into muscle fatigue, okay? But if you keep working out that muscle, you begin to recruit more calcium to that voltage-gated calcium channel, and you can outcompete the aberrant autoantibodies, and you could potentially relieve the symptoms, right? So Lambert ET myasthenic syndrome gets better with use, okay? But myasthenia gravis gets worse with use, okay? Now, the pathophysiology of myasthenia gravis, right? It's the formation of autoantibodies against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor okay so that's why you get the muscle weakness because you're not giving getting acetylcholine activity okay and the way you diagnose this disorder in general is you uh perform a test for the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies okay uh in fact that's currently the standard of care okay so be careful on exams with picking an edrophonium test that's no longer the standard of care the first line diagnostic test for myasthenia gravis is to check the serum for anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies okay but if you don't see that as an option on exams then you can pick uh the tensilin test okay where you administer hydrofolium hydrofolium is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor so by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase your levels of acetylcholine go up and those outcompete the bad antibodies okay and in general you treat myasthenia gravis with pyridostigmine pyridostigmine helps you get rid of myasthenia gravis okay pyridostigmine is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor so it boosts your acetylcholine levels and that can outcompete the bad antibodies that you find on the surface of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor and that could potentially relieve symptoms okay the associated uh, neoplasm with uh, myasthenia gravis is a thymoma okay classically shows up as an anterior mediastinal mass okay so if they give you an exam question where a person has a uh, myasthenia gravis one answer choice actually after you've made the diagnosis may be to get a chest ct scan okay to look for a thymoma okay before you start like uh, pharmacological treatment because there are some people where their myasthenia gravis could actually remit with the removal of the thymus okay so just keep that in mind okay next question now so where's the lesion what's the occluded artery right so loss of pain and temperature on the left face okay loss of pain and temperature on the right side of the body okay absent gag reflex right so that's like cranial nerve 9 or 10 territory okay and then vertigo so that's potentially cranial nerve 8 territory okay and then this person also has ptosis and meiosis on the left okay so they have like an ipsilateral horner syndrome okay so let's explain the pathophysiology here okay so let's localize the lesion right this is one of the reasons i love neurology localizing lesions you don't need to do some expensive testing you just need to sort of like uh, use your brain uh, to make the diagnosis so this patient has lost pain and temperature on the left face okay so this patient potentially uh, has involvement of the trigeminal nerve right that the part of the trigeminal nerve that contains control sorry pain and temperature sensation for the face remember it's ipsilateral innervation okay uh, the person has lost pain and temperature on the right side of the body right so they may have involvement of the spinal thalamic tract Remember, the spinal thalamic tract runs in the lateral, not medial, a lateral brain stem, okay? And it causes contralateral symptoms because remember, your spinal thalamic tract decussates at the level of the anterior white commissure in the spinal cord before it ascends in the brain stem. 
And then, so contralateral symptoms. So if they have symptoms on the right, they probably have the lesion on the left, okay? They have an absent gag reflex. That's cranial 9 slash 10 gone, okay? That's medulla, okay? Remember, your cranial nerves and where they line the brainstem, right? Cranial nerves uh, 9 through 12 line the medulla, okay? Vertigo, cranial 8, right? So cranial 8, that's like medulla-ish pons uh, territory, okay? And then ptosis and meiosis on the left, okay? So Horner's syndrome, right? So an involvement of the cervical sympathetic tract, okay, that goes all the way to the superior cervical ganglion that controls uh, dilation of the pupil. Uh, that's a part of the sympathetic nervous system, okay? Uh, Horner's syndrome lesions are usually ipsilateral, okay? And remember that those fibers that control the sympathetic nervous system innervation of the eye run in the lateral brainstem as well, okay? So if you put all these things together, you can sort of imagine that this person has has a lateral medullary syndrome okay in fact if I'm not mistaken this is known as Wallenberg's syndrome and the artery that's probably involved here is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery okay your pica okay because it supply it supplies the lateral medulla okay the lateral medulla now if a patient has right-sided paralysis and tongue deviation to the left okay again tongue deviation to the left okay that's a cranial 12 lesion Okay, uh, remember that the hypoglossal nerve runs in the medial medulla, okay, medial medulla, okay, so this is a medial medullary syndrome, and the reason they have the right-sided paralysis is that they have involvement of the corticospinal tract. Remember, the corticospinal tract, it decusates at the level of the medullary pyramids, and it runs in the medial, not lateral, medial brain stem, okay, so that's potentially why they have right-sided paralysis, because they have the um, lesion prior to the pyramidal decusation, okay? And the artery that's probably involved here is the anterior spinal artery, okay? Remember, the anterior spinal artery uh, supplies the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord, but it also supplies the medial medulla. Okay, so let's jump to the next question. Now, a 35 year old African American female presents with a three day history of eye pain, okay? Fondoscopic exam is notable for conjunctival erythema and meiosis. CBC is notable for increased ACE levels and a calcium of 12.9, okay? And let me also tell you that this African-American female has uh, has a shortness of breath. And I tell you that, oh, uh, she has a chest X-ray finding of bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Um, hopefully, this tells you that this patient has sarcoidosis, Okay. And the thing with sarcoidosis is that it usually presents with uh, like many problems, right? So it can present with like the respiratory difficulty. It can present with uh, the classic eye finding, right? So like eye pain, uh, that's uh, optic neuritis. And the classic presentation of that is you have eye pain uh, and like an afferent pupillary defect. And you can see that the person's eye is like red and it hurts as the person tries to move their eye. Okay, if you see that, think about uh, optic neuritis. Has a classic association with sarcoidosis. Also has a classic association with um, with what's this other disease? Multiple sclerosis. Okay, multiple sclerosis. Okay, now next question: thirty-five-year-old female with tremors in her hands bilaterally that are worsened by stretching of by stretching out her hand. Okay, uh, so what's the diagnosis, right? So uh, what if I give you the added information that it gets better when she takes alcohol, okay? Uh, hopefully that should get you thinking of an essential tremor, a benign essential tremor, okay? Uh, in general, these things are usually familial actually. They actually associate with autosomal dominant inheritance. And you want to differentiate, be able to differentiate this from Parkinson's disease, okay? A benign essential tremor is usually symmetric, Parkinson's disease tremors are usually asymmetric, okay? The benign essential tremors, the tremors are worsened by activity. The tremors you find in, the resting tremors you find in Parkinson's disease are usually made better with activity, okay? Um, and in general, the way you treat a benign essential tremor is with um, a beta blocker like propranolol or barbiturate uh, like primidone. Remember, barbiturates increase the duration of opening of chloride channels, so they cause hyperpolarization of neurons. Um, so you can use primidone, it's first line, or you can use propranolol, uh, non-selective beta blocker, okay? So blocks both beta one and two receptors. That's also first line as well, okay? 
So that's where I'm going to stop today. Uh, we'll continue with this in a different podcast. And I wish you all the best on whatever exam. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me a line and have a wonderful day and God bless. Thank you.